and welcome to Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. Thanks for joining us here on a Friday afternoon. With me today in the Think Tech studios, I have two uh, staff members from Smart Yields. Uh, we have Lizzie Schiller and Kristen Jamison. And uh, they are respectively the education and growth person and the uh, farm community uh, lead, I guess. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Least, more or less. All right. <laughs> So welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having us. So I suspect a lot of the people who are viewing this don't really know what, what Smart Yields is because it's sort of a startup, right? Can you maybe tell us just a sentence or two overview and then... Uh... Sure, yeah. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is we like to explain Smart Yields as the Fitbit for farming, the Fitbit for agriculture. Uh -huh. Um, and so, you know, what that means, just like you have a Fitbit, you know, I actually have a Fitbit on my watch right now, uh -huh. just like I'm running around and it's tracking all the data points for me so that I can see how I'm performing over time. Um, same thing for farmers. We can put sensors in the field and then that data from the sensors is being traveled up to our app mm -hmm. and our app is communicating to the farmers how their crops are performing 24-7. So real-time monitoring. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, Kristen, I think, can share a bit more, too. Yeah, we're bringing data science to the agricultural sector. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. okay, right. And farming has often been a rather uh, slow to pick up on, on new tech. And this is a real sort of a, a, a jump, a, a, I mean, a real game changer, right? Yeah, so this technology already exists for large-scale farmers, but the majority of the world's farmers are small to medium-sized farmers. Mm -hmm. And this technology currently isn't available to them because of cost limitations um, and other limitations. And so by really tailoring our solutions towards small and medium-sized farmers, it's revolutionary to be able to give them access to this kind of data, to be able to make good decisions and you know take the guesswork out of growing. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And so, so how did this get started? Is it, it's a local company, right? Yeah, we're a local company uh, based here in Honolulu, just right across the street. Mm -hmm. And we just went through Blue Startups, the Startup okay. Accelerator. And before that, we, so the team got incorporated yeah. a year ago. Yeah. Um, and before that. Yeah, so this is kind of the brainchild of Vincent Kimura. Um, he came up with the idea about five years ago and since then has been searching for a team. Okay. Um, and, you know, he's been able to gather the necessary parts um, and, you know, build a really inspiring team to make this happen. And we were able to go through Blue Startups, and now we're going through Accelerate UH as well. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So we've got a little, I guess, uh, this video that will uh, yes. show us what... Yes. So, you know, the basic idea for the why is, you know, why are we doing this? Well, by the year 2050, our country's pop our world's population is going to increase by over 40%. Um, and so, you know, how do we, how do we ensure food security? Exactly, yeah. right. exactly. So, you know, just like Kristen was saying, really large scale farms have, you know, a, access to money and funds to have these technologies like satellite data imaging. Right. But that's a, it's a pretty, pretty <laughs> large area. Pretty kind of large area, yeah. you know, small to medium sized farmers, they're not going to really get a lot of benefit out of that type of, we also have UAV data, data imaging. Of course, that's also very, um, costly. And then you got some on the ground sensors. Yeah, right? so this is really precision agriculture um, and using these variable rate technologies. Um, once again, not necessarily as applicable for your small and medium sized farmers. And right here, this can work for anyone. It can work from someone who has just a garden in their backyard to a school setting to, you know, small and medium sized farmers like we've been talking about. Yeah, and there, so there's real potential there then for this to, to grow on a global scale too and to, to get adopted more and more widely, just as in Africa they sort of skipped the whole landline and went from no phones to cell phones, right? Exactly. There's been a lot of interest in um, Hong Kong, South Korea, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really a technology that's going global. You know, data science is the next agricultural revolution. Yeah. Right. And the idea also, tagging on to Kristen, with the data science, the idea is as we continue to pull and aggregate the data coming from all these farmers around the world, we can continue to learn and the data analysts can then inform and drive decision making in the future. Oh, that's true, because if, so. if, if your app basically or some computer hooked to it is tracking all the data from the farmers, it can also alert other farmers, say, down the road that, oh, by the way, these guys over here are beginning to experience exactly. an or, infestation or right. whatever, mm -hmm. where their, their soil is drying out now and blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah. Right. Yeah. Or maybe even something like, oh, I want to grow sunflowers in my backyard. Let me open up the app and see you know, if there are any other people within my area that have grown sunflowers and what their recipe looks like, you know, uh -huh. what they were doing. Um, so. Uh -huh. 
Yeah. yeah. And on the subject of data aggregation too, you know, there are a host of data that are stored away and siloed away from each other. Mm -hmm. But if we can aggregate that data onto a central platform, we can learn a lot more from it. Yeah, this is, this is an amazing thing. And, and it, it, Smart Yields is a really interesting example of it. But the same thing is happening all around the world, basically. I have a, a colleague of mine who is an anesthesiologist at the Veterans Hospital in Seattle. And he started looking at several different data sets to try to f figure out why so many of the Iraq and Afghanistan vets were committing suicide, because it's a, it's a terrible problem. I mean, more people have died from suicide than to died in the fighting. And what he found was that by digging into multiple sort of disconnected siloed data sets and pulling that stuff together, patterns emerged about these people's hospital visits, uh, run-ins with law, uh, social worker interactions, these kind of things all began telling the story and, and there was a predictable pattern basically which of course now they can use to when they see this pattern show up for living service members that they, they understand these people are probably in some sense at high risk and so it, it, again it's sort of the, the same kind of thing, it's taking multiple disparate streams of mm -hmm. data, combining them and getting really rich information out. Yeah, really you know, uncovering those patterns of what makes successful agriculture. Yeah, and because it, you, can, you can adjust it in multiple ways, right? There's something, 80 different kinds of sensors that are potentially available. So you know, in some places, you're not going to care so much about one thing or another. You know, you, you're, if your so soil is well buffered, you may not care so much about pH, right? Uh, right, and going off of the sensor data points, you know, um, Smart Yields is hardware agnostic, meaning we are not specializing in working only with one specific type of sensor or another. Mm -hmm. If a farmer has a type of sensor that, that they're already using on their property, perhaps, mm -hmm. or they want to use, we are completely willing and interested in working with them to have our platform be able to pull that data yeah. um, so that they can use it. As long as they can sort of stream it out yes, somehow, right? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, in some reasonable form, you, yeah. you guys will, will take it and use it. That, that's wonderful. Right. Yeah. Um, that's a little different from, again, the, another this vaguely parallel thing that I think of as GLOBE, Global Learning and Observation to Benefit the Environment, a, a brainchild of Al Gore's many years ago, where they've set up at, mainly at schools, but a lot of places around the world, weather stations, basically. Mm. But they got very clear from the start. It's like everyone's got to use the same stuff here so that we know our measurements are all comparable, right? So it's one kind of rain gauge that you use and one kind of wind. Uh, they, you know, this kind of stuff. So they, they you know, it's it's interesting that, that you purposely build, as you say, an agnostic platform, basically. So you don't care how you're getting the data, just as long as it's coming in. That, that's 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 uh, again, particularly for a global kind of thing, that's great because people can adopt and adapt what they've got, what they've got already exactly. going. Yes, the hope is to make it as scalable yeah. as possible. Yeah. And. This is really, uh, it, it's intriguing, the, the work I do is, uh, a lot of my work is around water and drinking water issues in, on remote Pacific islands, and a number of them have very serious soil problems, particularly the lower islands, because they get washed over by the ocean periodically, mm -hmm. and the, they get too much salt in there. And again, being able to track salt levels locally from spot to spot could be an incredibly valuable thing. How how long did the way you stay over your land here basically is going to determine how much salt got in that and that can give you some sense about the recovery time your soil is going to need and mm -hmm. yeah timely alerts are extremely important for farmers in being able to mitigate and stop crop loss sure and so having this real-time monitoring of data is imperative to being able to avert um serious crises on the farm right yeah i mean it, it, it's mm -hmm sort of comparable to, to trying to play a football game if you were blindfolded, right? You, you couldn't do it very well, right? The, the game would be sort of a joke if, you, if only every, you know, three minutes or so you were allowed a moment of sight and could sort of see what, what went on. You couldn't really play the game very well, but in the same kind of thing, by allowing and encouraging continual real-time monitoring, you're really boosting the, 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 the fine-grained nature of, of the farmer's understanding of what the situation is, right? And off that analogy of the game, too, it's really hard if all of a sudden you take off your blindfold and the rules changed. <laughs> um, and that's what we're finding all over the world is the rules for agriculture are changing because our climate is changing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what's been generationally appropriate in the past may not hold true in the future. And so we really have to learn what's worked well to be able to adapt to new farming as our climate adapts. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. because things like, yes, yeah, soil temperature will be changing, and that's going to change planting dates, and yes, maybe the suitability of certain crops, cold tolerant crops may be moved to further 
higher elevations, more north of lat latitudes. Yeah. And especially um, when it comes to irrigation too, you know, wet places might get wetter, dry places might get drier. Right. And so as we have differing, you know, water rainfall patterns, that's really going to change the landscape of agriculture too, as well as pest movement, disease movement. So. Absolutely. The challenges right. facing farmers um, in the coming years are huge, and we really hope that data science can be a solution. It, it, you, you got you got to you sort of got to believe it. I mean, again, yeah. the challenge your film brought up with the population continuing to grow for the next uh, several decades uh, and the amount of arable land shrinking, um, we ha we have something of a of a. Uh, bad situation, shall we say, looming. And yeah, you, you need all, all the help you can get and, and a, a good, uh, real, having real-time data like that could be immensely valuable. Um, so so um, I'm being told, I think, that we need to go on, on to break here at this point. So we'll uh, come back after uh, a brief break. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Allen, here on Likeable Science. With me today are folks from Smart Yields. We'll be talking more about it when we come back. Aloha, my name is Justine Espiritu, yeah, I and I am the co-host yeah. of Hawaii Farmers like Series. About now, this though. is my co-host, <laughs> Matthew Johnson, yeah. and we are live with you every Thursday at 4 p.m. at thinktechhawaii.com. And our show focuses on Hawaii's local food uh, community. We feature not only the farmers that are producing our food, but we also feature the supporters and other folks involved in the community that are trying to promote local agriculture. <laughs> I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around. We'll see you then. And you're back here on Think Tech Hawaii here on Lakeable Science. I'm your host, Ethan Allen. With me today are Lizzie Schiller, Schiller and Kristen Jamison from Smart Yields. We've been talking about this uh, sort of amazing platform, I guess you call it, or application that combines multiple streams of data, depending on what's available, actually. Uh, a lot of it very localized, but also some more uh, high-level data, and allows farmers to monitor their, uh, the, the whole environment and many, many, many aspects of the environment on a more or less continuous basis. And it's a tremendously powerful uh, potential to, to really enable sort of optimization of growth, right? But the other thing that, that uh, I was hearing is, is that you're also going, uh, pushing this a little bit in, into the schools, right? And some of the schools who have learning gardens, right? So this is the idea that schools have do these gardens and use them to teach kids science and cooperative uh, work and all that kind of, those kind of good things. And now with, with this kind of tool, suddenly you can, this really opens up new vistas here for education, right? Yes, exactly. So, you know, we've already actually partnered with a few schools, including mm -hmm. Iolani. Mm -hmm. uh, they already have our sensors and they're using our platform okay. in the gardens. And the idea is just like what you said, to really empower the students and the teachers mm -hmm. to utilize this data science piece mm -hmm. of agriculture, of, you know, gardening, so that you know, the students are inspired and excited to hopefully be our world's future agriculture scientists and agriculture tech leaders. Yeah, and it, it's, it really it goes beyond that, though. So many students do not deal with data in a real way, mm. you know, in a sensible way. And this connects data in it by, yes. by doing it in a school garden. It becomes, mm -hmm. you begin to understand what the value of regular repeated observation is. What the, what the value of, of keeping a, a log, a journal is. Yes, uh, yes. Why, you know, how this data begins to build over time and give you this real, real sense. Oh, you can see the cycle appearing in the data. It's wet, then it's dry, then it's wet, then it's dry. And you begin to be able to say, oh, I know mm -hmm. we're going to need to go out and get more water on this thing because. Yes, and just like you were saying, um, the logging piece, that's also um, in our app as well. Right. Not only are you seeing data coming in, but the students or the farmers have the opportunity to record their observations, take pictures, monitor how much water you're putting into your crops every day, mm -hmm. um, measure you know, the amount of growth that you're seeing, mm -hmm. everything. So it's essentially data analytics, an aggregator, and record observation note keeper. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's very powerful. And the, the, the trend in the, in, uh, I know in the islands here is uh, place-based education and what, what 
this potential is got very deep knowledge of place and really helps tie seemingly this almost, um, what do you want to say, very traditional sort of, uh, you know, this is my lay on, this is, this is the, the earth that we live on with just really cutting edge technology, right? Where you really find out, okay, this is the earth, but it's not quite the same as it was yesterday, you know, and, and it's not gonna be quite the same as it is tomorrow, right? Things are shifting continually in various ways and hopefully not too radically, hopefully bouncing back and forth in, within some limits. Uh, but again, great to know if you don't, if you start to exceed those limits or push towards, you know, towards some boundaries, best, best you know about it early, right? And yes. this can really enable a farmer or a teacher or a community to, to know much more about their, their local environment and, and what's, what's liable to happen. Exactly, uh, exactly. And, and on the education side of things, just to add a little bit more, the you know, pretty new standards, the next generation science standards, right. they're being adopted nationwide. Right. And you know, as, I'm, as we're going through the standards and, and really looking at the alignment with Smart Yields and the NGSS, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here. So, you know, we're in the process right now of developing curricula mm -hmm. associated, aligned with both Smart Yields and the NGSS. Uh -huh. um, so we're very excited for uh, the future with that too and partnering with more schools in the process. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <coughs> and, and it goes to even informal science education too. Mm. Communities, uh, a lot of communities these days are, are facing sort of increasingly marginal, marginalized environmental conditions. And having this kind of data could really help them make a sensible choice about when, you know, when is, is it that you sort of give up on your current place and say it's time to up and move our whole village and, and move it to higher ground or move it further south or whatever needs to, needs to happen, you know, uh, versus just sort of saying, well, maybe it's going to get better, maybe it's going to get better tomorrow, and uh, that being caught in a bad disaster. Um, so, right. very, uh, very critical on a lot of different levels. I, I can see that the, the value of this. Um, yeah. What's uh, what size is Smart Yield? I mean, what, 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 I mean how, how, where, where are these things being deployed? You say in, in schools locally and in farmers locally here. But yes. So we are, you know, a team of about 12 right now and growing. Um, in terms of, you know, the farms and the locations that we're working with right now, uh, we're working with farms, farmers in California, Washington, Oregon, of course, Hawaii, mm -hmm. Hong Kong. Colorado. Colorado. Okay. And so. I think we've had over 80,000 um, requests for demos, so there's a huge level of interest, mm. you know, from the farmer community. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I believe a lot of places, uh, I believe places like Japan would, would want this, where you've got real limitations on land and really want to maximize your productivity. Uh, even I suspect places like China, where they've, because they, they've uh, messed up so much of their land that they, they really are, are facing some of these same issues of, of much smaller nations, of having too many people and not enough li uh, food production areas. They're also really interested in um, incorporating data science and traceability into the agricultural landscape. Um, recently, a new set of guidelines, the Food Safety Modernization Act, mm -hmm. um, has been passed. And so there are really new strict regulations on what kinds of food can and cannot be sold and imported in the United States. And so in order for foreign farmers to be able to, you know, plug their products into the United States market, they're going to have to meet these standards. Mm -hmm. And so traceability is a huge part of that. And so data science can also really help leverage that. And so that's one of the large interests, too, coming from China when it comes to data science in mm -hmm. agriculture. No, that's, yeah, I, I can see the value of that because you, you're going to want to know that uh, the food that's coming into the food stream, basically, you know, meets certain standards, mm -hmm. that, you know, has enough of X and not too much of Y, you know, uh, whatever they, they may be, you know, pesticides or residues of, of this kind of chemical or that. Yeah. Or was, you know, post-harvest stored at the right temperature for the right amount of time, yeah. you know, that it's safe for consumption. Yeah, it, re it really uh, will allow a, a, a very fine detailed tracking again on, on, on products. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that could be very much uh, a valuable part of it. One kind of fun new um, tracking technology that I'm just kind of learning about is stickers that actually will be able to have um, temperature sensors in the stickers. So right. imagine being able to slap that on a box and measure what temperature that food is kept at for its entire life cycle. Yes, I've, I've, those actually are being used yeah. in, some, in some industries well, already for, uh, I think, the pharmaceutical industry use them because if your some medications need to be kept, you know, refrigerated, and it, these tags will basically turn red, you know, if, if the temperature has not been kept cold, if they've gotten too warm once, and so it lets you know right away. Yeah, uh, to, to begin to integrate that again, as you say, that this, this being able to meld the data 
is so critical now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's actually got a lot of perils now that I think about it. Uh, Tesla, for instance, now has all of these, the, their new cars have always on internet connections and have huge arrays of sensors on them. And Tesla is gathering all this data from all these cars being driven around now um, see, and, and uh, using that data to inform how they, how they build the next generation of cars, right? Uh, but again, it, it's pulling driving habits together with, with road conditions, with wear and tear on the cars. I mean, all these different kinds of, of, of information are now available that were not available before. You would love to be the yeah. Tesla of agriculture and science. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's, that, no, that's, uh, that's a, very, a, very, a very admirable uh, sort of model in a sense, right? Um, to, to see that, that idea. And uh, it sounds like they're really, they're really on to that. Um, what are the production of the, uh, I mean, you say that you call this an app, but there's clearly got to be a certain amount of hardware associated with it, right? So we can actually fit in with any hardware on the market. That's what hardware agnostic mm -hmm. means. Okay. Um, we're also in the process, too, of developing better hardware, too, that has longer um, transmission um, distances so that, you know, it really solves the connectivity issues that a lot of farms have. You know, if they don't have Wi-Fi, it could be difficult to pull that data to the cloud. Um, so we are working on developing some better long-range um, transmission sensors. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were just in a team meeting earlier today, uh, kind of, well, really discussing the hardware aspect of it and some of the issues that we're already encountering with some of the farmers, such as, um, you know, connectivity and power. Mm -hmm. We have a sensor out in the field, out in a garden, but if there isn't power and there isn't access to Wi-Fi, how is that, you know, sensor going to interact with our, with our platform? It's, it's right. not unless we have something. So right. we started, you know, brainstorming, well, what if we got a small solar unit and attach it to the sensor right. and then had 3G running right. with that? So uh, we're excited about the future and we're, you know, constantly brainstorming different ways to tap into the current hardware needs and also, like Kristen said, thinking about uh, future hardware needs and how our team can work to do that. Yeah, I, I, I suspect, uh, you know, it must, must be tied into the, the whole stuff. Uh, solar photovoltaic stuff because that's that's an obvious source for the to power the remote sensors in particular farms which depend on sunlight right mm -hmm. uh, and yeah as you say you have to also get the connectivity issue that's that would be the hard part in some of these remote Pacific islands because the connectivity is so lousy in those places mm -hmm. uh, but more of the world now uh, is I mean, it's getting so much better connected every day not just in the US but but uh, a lot of other parts of the world so it's uh, very going to be very exciting to see where this goes. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's. The, I, so I, I, again, I don't know much about smart yields, but does your CEO? I mean, he must have a business plan, right? So, so what, what, what does he see in five years? Where, where is smart yields going to be in five years? Five years. Wow, that's that's I mean, a that's had, a bit down the road. I mean, you know, if we could be the Tesla <laughs> of you know data science and agriculture, that'd be amazing. You know, um, I think as we continue to aggregate the data and have it inform our practices and continue to develop better hardware solutions, mm -hmm. you know, really having smart yields and interacting with a bunch of other technologies to really come together and, you know, like we were saying for the why at the beginning, mm -hmm. in, by 2050, our world's population is increasing mm -hmm. by 40%. Right, right. That is crazy. And yeah. so, you know, really coming together, working with a lot of different partners, throughout the world to, you know, make it a sustainable future for everyone involved. Right. No, I was thinking actually when we were talking at the start about, about the, bringing this team together, mm. this team, you must have a lot of very, people with very diverse backgrounds there because you've got, you've got to have the people who know sort of the sensors, you've got to have the people who sort of understand the app end of it. You've got to have the people who can talk to, to both of those people and, and do the computer stuff sort of in between it, right? Uh, you've got to have people who actually know farming. Right, uh, and, yes, and, and, we have farmers on board. Yeah, yeah, I mean. We have hardware developers, we have software developers. That's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you gotta have, have yeah. That, that whole slew. And then that, the business gurus. Right. And then we're always looking for more hardware and software tech savvy people who want to join the team. You know, mm -hmm. finding the right talent is honestly the biggest challenge that we face. Sure, yeah. well, I mean, yeah. that, that's yeah. believable. It's because you, you, you're, you're really working out there uh, on what they sometimes call the bleeding edge, right? Uh, that's, a, that's a very, 
uh, it's a dangerous place to be because, yeah, it, it often is. It's hard to, pick, to get the right people involved and, and with the right kind of energy, the right kind of knowledge, the right kind of set of skills. Uh, yes, very exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's wonderful. And you, you guys are, are well set here in, in terms of your careers, right? <laughs> We're having a lot of fun. We're learning so much mm -hmm. and so happy to be a part of a mm -hmm. growing, exciting, relevant, Excellent. relevant group of people. Yeah. Excellent. Well, then. Tell me this, and as, as you wrap things up, what, what would your advice be to the students of today who might want to get into this kind of, of thing for tomorrow? What, what kinds of uh, courses should they pursue? What, what kinds of learning should they undertake? Yeah, I mean, definitely, as Chris and I were saying, data science. That mm -hmm. is so big, not just in the agriculture industry, but mm -hmm. across, you know, all industries, data science is one of the next biggest things. And It's a huge. Yeah, huge, it, yeah. huge. You, you, Kristen... And I would just really encourage students that when you're in classrooms to be as engaged as possible. It's an amazing opportunity to be a student. Mm -hmm. um, I know because I just graduated and I already miss it a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> as much as I love Smart Yields, of course. But um, to really ask good questions um, and to always seek out opportunities um, to get those hands-on experiences. So go visit a farm, go pull weeds, go volunteer in the low E. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that I would really recommend to students. Yeah, yeah excellent. The, the, Getting back just for a moment to the data science, you know, UH Hilo is actually starting a whole data science yeah. program now. They're going to be hiring mm -hmm. data science faculty and really running this all in connection with another big project they're doing here. So it's uh, very, very exciting. Wow. Yes, very exciting. We actually, um, me and Ryan, uh, one of the other members of the team, we were at UH Hilo a couple of weeks ago huh. and we met with the drone researchers there oh. and we we're discussing potential opportunities for oh. collaboration in the future. So. Okay. Well, yeah. you, you get on with the guy who does <laughs> drones here. Anyhow, yeah. I, I think we're about running our time. Okay. So, uh, Lizzie, Kristen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I wish you the best of luck with Smart Yield. Sounds like you're going great guns. Uh, and I hope you'll come back and join us next week on another round of Likeable Science here on Friday at 2 p.m. Bye-bye.